This is Popular Front, a podcast focused on the niche details of modern warfare and underreported conflict with me, Jake Hanrahan. Today we're speaking to John Ioannou and Zinanas Ciaras. They run a website called Geopolitical Cyprus. Uh, they're researchers, journalists, analysts. They're going to be speaking to us about Turkey's uh, increasingly worrying expansionist plans into Cyprus. There will soon be a meeting trying to sort out this situation between the occupied North Cyprus where Turkish troops are and the Greek Cypriots and the rest. Um, it's not looking like it's going to go too well. So these two are going to talk to us about that. If you like what we're doing, please support Popular Front at patreon.com slash popular front. So we're going to be talking about Cyprus before we get into what's happening right now with Turkey kind of eyeing it up a little bit. Um, maybe go into the history of the situation there for us, please, because I think there's a lot of listeners that are quite young here will have no recollection or won't have heard about the kind of conflict there, the occupation, some might call it, of certain parts of Cyprus by Turkey. Maybe just go into that for us and explain uh, the history and why there's a potential conflict looming. The Cyprus problem remains one of the unsolved problems in this part of the world, in the whole uh, uh, sub-periphery of the Eastern Mediterranean, and it's also a very important historically issue regarding the Greek-Turkish relations. The history of the Cyprus problem goes back uh, to the early 50s during the decolonization era, and then it was uh, during uh, the uh, Greek Cypriot armed struggle uh, for freedom and independence. It was uh, uh, a lot of uh, problems arise. And then when Cyprus gained its independence in 1960s, in 1960, the exact date, uh, it was a constitutional crisis and a lot of interference from Greece, Turkey, at the peak of Cold War, let's say. And all these ethnic conflict and tensions uh, that uh, followed the, the early history of modern day Cyprus as an independent state ended up with the Turkish invasion in 1974 that led to the occupation of almost 37% of the Cyprus territory, the Cyprus North, and uh, afterwards, there is a long, long history of uh, negotiations that are going around uh, for many years without uh, reaching to a comprehensive solution, let's say, to the Cyprus dispute. And all these dynamics, all this history is also meddling the last uh, decades with the upcoming and the, let's say, the geopolitical importance and rise of the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, long story short, it remains uh, a, a, a frozen conflict, but at the same time, a problem uh, that cannot be solved that is going on for decades. Keep in mind that this uh, this problem is is not just decades old, but goes back to you know the Ottoman occupation and the British uh, colonialism and all the um, the issues that uh, this. Um, these past experiences of the island have um, um, uh, left behind and uh, how different uh, social identities and ethnic identities were formed and how different interests were uh, filtered uh, from there on through these identities. Uh, that is basically the definition of an ethnic conflict and, and how that culminated to, um, to the invasion of 74 effectively rendering the Cyprus problem an international problem as well, not merely a, um, an ethnic or communal, intercommunal communal problem. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why its resolution is so difficult, because there are so many actors and interests involved um, that uh, makes negotiations and, uh, and the settlement of, of various 
issues of the conflict um, are very complex. Yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit about the invasion in 74 and how that conflict played out. It was, an, uh, let's say, an aeronautical operation uh, during two different phases. Uh, the ongoing armed conflict in Cyprus was continuing with uh, uh, support from the two countries. I mean, Greece was arming the Greek Cypriots, Turkey was arming the Turkish Cypriots. And uh, in 1974, before the Turkish invasion in Cyprus, it was uh, a coup that took place from the Greek military junta in order to overthrow the president of Cyprus, Makarios. And after five days, Turkey decided to invade. It was uh, actually uh, an intense fight that uh, took place in two different phases with uh, classic infantry fighting, uh, aerial bombardments, uh, use of uh, lots of uh, weapons. And uh, the first phase started in July 20th of 1974. Then it was uh, a day of truce and some negotiations in Geneva and international level. And then the second uh, phase of, the, of this military invasion that took place in August 15th, just a couple of days uh, later, ended up with a complete uh, capturing of uh, around 37% of the Cyprus territory. Uh, after uh, this invasion, a lot of other problems occurred and complicated things. Uh, there is a lot of missing persons and uh, a lot of investigations the last years in order to retrieve their, uh, their bodies. Uh, there was also uh, the creation of uh, an armistice line that divides Cyprus exactly in the middle. It's around 176 kilometers from the one uh, side of the island to the other. And uh, after the Turkish invasion, a lot of fights did not happen in Cyprus. Uh, I mean, there was no resume of fight like in other conflicts of uh, similar type. Right, there was a militant group as well, right? Like uh, Greek Cypriot, the EOKA, they were like an ultra-nationalist group or something. Um, what role did they play in all of that? Well, they, they were part of the... Um of the nationalist sort of, um, um, you know, group here in Cyprus uh, in, in 74, they, uh, 73, 74, they attended, they attempted a, a coup in, um, in cooperation with the Greek junta um, of the time uh, between 60, uh, they were in power between 67 and 74 roughly. Um, and uh, obviously they were the ones that conducted the coup Mm. in Cyprus, um, uh, and that was the, the basic um, pretext that um, Turkey used to invade as one of the, um, well, being one of the um, guarantor powers of the 1960 constitution, uh, uh, along with Greece and the United Kingdom. So what Turkey said at the time was that it would uh, intervene to um, restore the constitutional order that uh, collapsed because of the coup um, that, that EOKA B, EOKA B actually conducted yeah. because EOKA was also the organization that um, conducted the anti-colonial struggle in the 50s. That, that was a different organization. So it was like, um, it was like how the IRA were around in the, in the 20s, EOKA B would have been like the provisional version. Like, so the provisionals came back, the IRA provisionals came back in the 80s. Uh, the seventies, so Ioka B was like the next iteration of that, right? In 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 a, in a way, yes, but um, um, these these are not the same persons exactly. Some of them, you know, obviously uh, had had history with Ioka, mm. and um, the, the the leader of Ioka was is is said to be involved in in Ioka B, although he was not around when when the coup took place. Um, but um, uh, they were, they're, 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 um, the, let's say that the cause behind the OKA and the OKA B was, as, although it was essentially the same, so union with Greece, 
um, the, um, they, they had a very different uh, legitimization mm. because they were a, uh, an illegal paramilitary group in the 70s and, and earlier, uh, but they were, you know, an anti-colonial uh, movement, um, a guerrilla uh, group in the 50s, and that among Cypriots at least, that, that had a very different uh, role and, and legitimization, and, and that's important, mm. uh, especially because of what the OKB uh, caused with that coup, you know, the intervention, the, the, the Turkish invasion and, and, and the subsequent occupation of, of Cyprus as the north. Right, right. Um, so after after the invasion, 1974 passes, what happened then? I know that the Turks didn't just leave, right? Like, how did the situation progress? I mean, there was a different round of uh, negotiation talks under the auspices of the United Nations. But uh, what was game-changing on behalf of Turkey is what happened during the November of 1983, when uh, Turkey and the Turkey Cypriot uh, leadership decide to, to come up with the idea of uh, a state in the north. So we have the, the legal declaration of the so-called Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus that changed uh, a lot the dynamics within the, the frame, the dialogue between the two communities uh, under the, the United Nations. And there was a series, let's say, of different uh, type of talks that uh, uh, short story is uh, that they created the, let's say, the context or the uh, the outline of how a comprehensive solution, a Cyprus settlement, could be, and this is uh, uh, to a great extent related until nowadays that we have a huge debate on that uh, around the idea of a bizonal by communal federation. So we keep the federation model and how we can reunite, reunify the, the, the island of Cyprus. And uh, let's say just to round because the, there are many, many different uh, small details that are of no interest uh, for those who are not so much into the Cyprus problem. Uh, all the negotiation led to 2004, which is a very important year, when uh, the Anand plan was proposed and was agreed between the two communities. Uh, at the same time, EU, uh, Cyprus managed to, to make it to the EU to become a full member of the European Union. So in 2004, we have Anand plan, we have a comprehensive uh, model and settlement, that was uh, the, the, that the two communities have to vote over two different referenda. Uh, the Turkish Cypriot community agreed that uh, an unplanned plan can be implemented, so they, they voted uh, for an unplanned plan, and the Greek Cypriot side rejected. So 2004, it's a very interesting year, a turning point in the history of the Cyprus dispute, the Cyprus problem, because of the Anand plan and the rejection of Anand plan by the Greek Cypriot community. Right. So so then what kind of, how do people identify then? Is, are there any people that just say we're just Cypriots or is it all Greek Cypriot, Turkish Cypriot, North Cypriot, whatever? Like, how does that work? Well, that's part of, of our identity crisis, I would right. say. So... There's, uh, I would say that most people call themselves nowadays either Greek Cypriots or Turkish Cypriots, but um, many Greek Cypriots, for example, would also identify as Greeks, you know, ethnically or yeah. in terms of heritage and culture and so on, and in terms of, you know, national identity. Um, so uh, um, within both communities, you, you will find people who identify as Greek Cypriots, or as, as Cypriots, as Turkish Cypriots, as Greeks, as Turks. Um, and uh, that's, that's actually one of the main um, uh, re reasons or factors of, of the conflict. Um, because we, we have a great difficulty 
getting over uh, or going uh, beyond our ethnic identity and um, uh, building a, a state uh, that will be able to encompass all, all of those identities without any uh, discrimination. And, and that's also part of the negotiations, uh, the notion of, of political equality uh, between the two communities. Uh, but at the same time, I should mention that there are other communities that are also embedded in the constitution, like uh, we have a small Armenian or Latin or Maronite mm. uh, community as well. Uh, so the, the question is, how do you ensure that the future um, state, be it federal state or, or some other sort of solution, will... Uh, will be able to um, uh, secure the, the 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 rights of of all these communities in a, in a fair uh, in a fair way. Yeah, it does sound complicated. Um, so, what's the situation now? Where where North Cyprus is? Where the where the Turks are? Um, are there there's still soldiers there? I mean, I, I've seen there's a kind of fence. Like, is it completely separated, or do people just kind of pass through free, freely? Like, how serious is it now? Uh, there is uh, a huge uh, military presence by the Turkish armed force, TSK, the Turkish army. Mm. But at the same time, when Cyprus entered the EU, part of this protocol of uh, uh, Cyprus uh, membership in the EU was the opening of some checkpoints uh, that, that are certain rules for Greek Cypriots to visit the north, the occupied north, and Turkish Cypriots to visit the south. So there is interaction between the two communities among people who are feeling right, so go visit the north and vice versa. Mm. And of course, all these aspects are related to some important uh, uh, subjects of the negotiation that uh, has to do with the territorial adjustments and the property issue, which is very important because the majority of Greek Cypriots uh, that uh, used to live in the north before 74 and the Turkish Cypriots that were living in the south also before 74 lost their properties. So we have also this important aspect that has to do with human rights, with your right to property. And uh, at the same time, in different uh, timings, for example, in the mid-90s, there was some tension along this fence. But after 2004, there is a form of normalization between the two communities to move freely uh, all across the island. Now, this is uh, somehow affected because of the pandemic crisis, because of the COVID uh, measures. But uh, generally, the two communities are not isolated. Since 2004, they meet each other. There is a lot of uh, uh, bi-communal uh, actions among the society of the peoples and some NGOs. Uh, so there is a form of normality. It's not like other types of fences, like, for example, in South Ossetia or Nagorno-Karabakh or similar areas. Okay, okay, so it's not as formalized then as that. Um, so what's happening now? I know last year, it was when we were talking about this, I uh, started seeing Erdogan suddenly start mentioning Cyprus as if he didn't have his finger in enough countries. Why is he suddenly kind of rattling the cage again about Cyprus? Um, and just give us an idea of what he's actually been saying as well. Yeah, well, um, of, I would say that since 2017, Things have changed a lot when it comes to the settlement of the Cyprus problem and the, and the discussions around it because of the of the collapse of the talks in in the summer of 2017 in Grand Montana um, and since then um, uh, Turkey has made it very clear in public that um, uh, they will stop negotiating um, along the same parameters that they've been doing so far. Um, uh, specifically, they were referring to uh, the concept of a, of a bisonal, bicommunal federation. And they gradually, since uh, 2017, started bringing into the discussion the, the notion of a two-state solution. 
Um, the same happened um, uh, in, in, the, in the Republic of Cyprus, in the Greek Cypriot community, uh, in the sense that um, different new ideas about the resolution of the problem started flying around, like uh, the idea of, of a decentralized federation or a loose federation and so on. So uh, it seems that there has been over the past three years, let's say, a paradigm shift when it comes to uh, the resolution of the problem. And now we're moving uh, closer to a, to a, conf a confederal paradigm, I would say. So what Erdogan has been doing is that he's 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 been trying to um, uh, create more bargaining chips for Turkey and the and the Turkish Cypriots um, in various ways. For example, by sending various you know survey ships or drill ships to to explore and drill within um, uh, Cyprus's maritime uh, area, the exclusive economic zone or um, opening the enclosed city of, uh, of Arosha uh, in Famagusta um, uh, and, and, and thereby um, basically uh, making the Greek Cypriots negotiate um, uh, more things that they would normally have to. So now they, they, they feel pressure to negotiate uh, issues like the the, the um, energy resources of the island, uh, also the different territories like Famagusta and Varosha that used to be uh, some kind of a given uh, that that Greek Cypriots would eventually uh, get that uh, that territory after a settlement of the problem, uh, and so on. And obviously, he's also raising the negotiating bar. Uh, by saying that Turkey wants a two-state solution and, and making that very clear and official. So uh, by going to the table, to the negotiating table with, with Turkey and the Turkish Cypriots at this point in time, uh, it seems that there will be a tough negotiation because if, if the Greek Cypriot side is, is pursuing a federal solution, um, but, uh, well, a type of a, of a federal solution, but the, the, the other side is is pursuing a two-state solution, then you can um, easily um, uh, see that um, the end result will be somewhere in the middle of that. And uh, uh, currently there is a great uncertainty about what the outcome might be. Will it be a federal model? Will it be a confederal model? How, many, how much authority will the constituent states will have or the central government? Um, and so on. So I would say that this context is um, is is created by Erdogan uh, and, and, and Turkey to um, uh, force a different uh, settlement to the problem that will that will um, ensure and um, secure more rights uh, for Turkey, more rights and more interests. Mm. Do you think this is kind of just part of Erdogan's blatant kind of neo-Ottomanism, you know, he's trying to expand into all these different countries, into Syria, Libya, he even sent troops recently to Azerbaijan to fight against the Armenians. Do you think this is part of his expansion or do you think this is something else? Do you think this is more kind of true to the, the Cypriot legacy, I guess? Well, I, I don't call it neo-Ottomanism, but I can see why people do, uh, because there is an aspiration and a nostalgia that stems from mm. the Ottoman past. But um, uh, I would agree with you that this it, it has to do with this um, revisionism, I call it, uh, foreign policy revisionism or geopolitical revisionism in the broader Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean that saw Turkey, you know, uh, intervening in Syria, in Iraq, in nagorno karabakh in, um, in, in Libya, in various ways in the Eastern Mediterranean, and so on. So I would say that um, this, is, uh, this is part of a greater plan that Turkey has to emerge as a great power. And to do that, it needs access to, uh, you know, maritime space, um, it needs to, to be able to project power, different kinds of power abroad, uh, far away from its own borders, as it has been doing uh, over the past. I mean, Libya is a prime example and uh, countries like, you know, Somalia and then Sudan and, and the Niger and so on. Um, 
but uh, the Eastern Mediterranean remains a, a big gap in this strategy because without the resolution of the Cyprus problem, um, the Eastern Mediterranean remains some sort of, uh, um, in some way divided and, and polarized because on the one hand you have Turkey doing all these things and on the other hand you have countries like Cyprus, Israel, Egypt, um, uh, Greece, uh, occasionally France, uh, the Emirates uh, as extra regional um, uh, actors uh, forming these partnerships that uh, um, are trying to counterbalance in a way uh, the Turkey's power projection. Uh, so uh, this reality uh, makes the implementation of Turkey's plans more difficult. So Turkey figures that if, if there is a settlement, obviously a beneficial settlement for Turkey in Cyprus, then a lot of this tension will be alleviated and uh, Turkey will, be, will have a, a more, a, an easier access to the Eastern Mediterranean and the, and the security and energy architecture that has been developing in this, in this region. Uh, and thereby, uh, Turkey will be, um, it, it will be easier for Turkey to become stronger uh, in, terms of, um, uh, in, in terms of economy, in terms of energy resources, in terms of political and geopolitical influence abroad, um, and so on. So I would place Cyprus in this broader geopolitical vision that Turkey has, yes. Right, so then what does Turkey actually want there then? Like, if, let's say it like that, if, if Erdogan got his way, I know he's using a lot of this nationalist rhetoric, but he always does that. He kind of harks back to decades, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago. Um, what do you think, if in an ideal world for Erdogan, what does he actually want in Cyprus? I think the, the, the idea of Turkey's strategy regarding Cyprus, it's uh, a form of control. And this control could be achieved either by a type of solution in the Cyprus problem that would allow Turkey to intervene either towards EU or towards the internal uh, policies of uh, a future reunited Cyprus. And the second most important about what Erdogan wants, it's uh, his upcoming uh, years. I mean, uh, in 2023, uh, Erdogan would love to place himself 100 years after the establishment, the founding of modern day Turkey as a political figure that uh, expanded or made Turkey a greater state than uh, what uh, Ataturk gave to the Turks. So this is an important aspect that we need also to take into consideration. The other thing that one could argue about is that uh, uh, the whole Eastern Mediterranean uh, periphery is uh, becoming a more intense and more important uh, geopolitical space, uh, like the MENA countries used to be for many decades. So in this uh, new uh, subsystem, Cyprus, because of its uh, geographic uh, uh, position, uh, could play an important role. It's, uh, we, we, don't, we, we, we don't forget that Cyprus, it's the only uh, European uh, Union member state in this part mm. of the world. And it is very important for everyone because, you know, everyone is in Cyprus. I mean, the British army is in Cyprus. There are British sovereign uh, bases uh, in Cyprus. Cyprus is playing an important role regarding the collecting info from Middle East or on the global coalition against Daesh. There are many different uh, geopolitical aspects that uh, Cyprus uh, has uh, a small foot in. Yeah, um, and there was some trouble in the sea recently. This hasn't just been all talk. There has been actual problems. So there was this situation in the sea, if I remember. Like, I think the boats got too close or they clashed or something. Um, remind me, what happened there? Uh, this is what happened uh, some months ago between Greece and Turkey. This, this is a different aspect. Uh, I mean, Turkey tried after three years of illegal drills in the Cyprus 
exclusive economic zone, they try to do something similar by sending not a drill ship, but a, a seismic survey vessel very close to the 20th parallel, this uh, maritime area between Greece, Turkey, Cyprus and Egypt, that uh, it's uh, very important and very neuralgic regarding the boundaries and the maritime borders between all the countries uh, in the area. So Turkey, what is, uh, has already performed or did in Cyprus the last uh, three and a half years, is now trying to do the same in the Aegean, focusing especially on the Castellorizo uh, island complex of Greece. And this is part of a, a certain policy of Turkey uh, uh, on, on Greece about the maritime disputes in the Aegean Sea and what Turkey is interpreting as its own version of the international law of the sea and uh, all these grey zones that it's putting in the Aegean. This is not strictly related to the Cyprus dispute, but it's part of the revisionist foreign policy my colleague Zinon has talk, talked about. Right, and because of the proximity and the occupation of the North, I think it's pretty relevant at the same time, right? I think, you know, as as, as wild as Erdogan is, he's not stupid, you know what I mean? He must see how that looks to the rest of the people around there, specifically Cyprus, I imagine. On, on, on whether Erdogan is, um, let's say, irrational or not, um, I... I, I... Obviously, he's not stupid. He sees what's going on. He sees the reactions he of of both, you know, Cypriots and the international community. Um, but there is a, a a big element of 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 risk in in Erdogan's foreign policy, and uh, it's 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 what we call um, uh, a policy of brink, brinkmanship. Mm. So he he he, he uh, will um, go as far as he can. And push the limits, uh, but um, in the end, if there is some uh, great pushback, uh, significant pushback, especially from uh, international power, I mean, great powers or some other uh, actor in the international community, um, uh, then he he might then um, fall back. Um, now, I'm. Um, I think, though, that he realizes that the, the, in the case of Cyprus uh, and, and the Eastern Mediterranean, um, Cyprus is, is the weakest link of, of, of what's going on. So, he, uh, so Erdogan figures that uh, he can sort of manipulate uh, Cyprus or coerce Cyprus into, um, into accepting things uh, at the negotiating table. And at the same time, um, he's trying to somehow uh, disconnect the issue of Cyprus from, from the uh, other issues that Greece and, and Turkey um, are facing. And I think that um, uh, he, he achieved that to a certain extent because they are right now um, uh, discussing with, with Greece about the various issues that they um, that they that they have between them, uh, without bringing the Cyprus problem into the equation, um, and and the EU is involved in there as well. So so there are two fronts right now. One is you know the Greek Turkish issues, and the other one is the Cyprus problem. Obviously, Erdogan sees that uh, as a um, in in the big picture, they see he sees that the two sort of. Um, uh, complementing each other or being connected in some way, but he um, uh, he, he tries to undermine the the, um, uh, the the power of either Cyprus and Greece to uh, come together and form a, 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 co a cohesive front against against Turkey. Um, uh, so he handles the two issues, although he sees them being connected, he handles them uh, separately, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, no, it does. Um, I mean, I think it's, I, I, don't, I don't think it's wrong to say that the international community pretty much lets Turkey get away with mostly whatever it wants, despite, you know, saying they're deeply concerned and all that bullshit. 
Um, but what has been the actual pushback from Cyprus within within like the community there, the people that live there? How are the people on the ground, not not people in the government, like how are people there finding this? Are they worried? Do they think something's going to happen? Like, what's the reaction? They are very worried because this time it seems that there is the end of the Cyprus problem as we traditionally know it. I mean, Greek Cypriots used to be for many decades uh, pro-status quo. I mean, if there was no solution and the Cyprus Republic continuing going, there was no problem for the majority of Greek Cypriots. But now things are changing dramatically. And it's not only the security dilemma, it's also the economic conditions, uh, the internal political scenery with a lot of corruption scandals that are going on in Cyprus with all this uh, passport scheme. Uh, and also people do realize but that uh, if there is no solution this time, we are moving towards a partition scenario, which uh, makes, uh, transforms, if you like, the northern part of Cyprus to terra incognita. I mean, maybe even the Turkey Cypriots, which at the end of the day, they are still Cypriots mm. and trying to resist uh, all this uh, religious and economic pressure by Erdogan, uh, maybe flee Cyprus. And we have uh, uh, a completely different scenery in the north. And at the end of the day, the Turkey Cypriot community are citizens of the Republic of Cyprus. So they can move uh, in the upcoming years under the light of uh, game-changing uh, things that are going to happen on the ground in the South. So we have a new phase of ethnic conflict or the Cyprus problem, what I call it, 2.0, an updated version of the problem in the half uh, part of Cyprus. Uh, so this is very important to see what's going to happen with the upcoming informal meeting that is going to take place uh, on, on April 27, and to see if there is still common ground among the two communities, which is uh, uh, the most involved actors in the negotiation, and if we really want to live together or live separately. This is a, a very important trend to follow regarding the Cyprus problem. But there is reaction from certain uh, groups of people in Cyprus that are still wanted to live in peace and coexist in a unified, reunited uh, Cyprus. Um, not, not to be too dramatic, but if this all kind of falls apart, if there isn't... Uh if it's not worked out, do you think it's possible that maybe even like a new war could break out there in Cyprus over this? Or is it, it's not at that level? I think it's not the, the, the likeliest scenario. Mm. Um, um, of course, it depends on, on the context, on, on, on the likely crisis that might emerge and so on. It depends on whether there will be intercommunal um, political violence and so on. Um, th there are um, uh, there are the conditions to to argue that this might happen in the yeah. future. So there is always uh, even small groups that uh, could likely uh, proceed to such to such um, actions. But overall, I, I would say that um, Cypriots are are not prone to conflict. Mm. Uh, we would not like to see this um, becoming a hot conflict again. Um, and I think that's also one of the reasons why uh, the Cyprus problem has remained largely a frozen conflict over the past decades. Um, of course, you always have Turkey, that is um, um, a variable that cannot be well, yeah, entirely is. predicted. Um, and I would imagine that if there, there is a, a crisis and, and some political violence, Turkey might try to exploit that. Uh, but other than that, I, I think it's important, and that's why, and that's why this is one of the things we, we, we are discussing and negotiating. It's important to ensure that that the political system will will be uh, stable and without and and, and 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 not producing crises or deadlocks, um, and also have mechanisms for uh, conflict and and crisis uh, resolution. Um, but uh, overall, I, I think um, that if, if we manage to get to the solution, 
uh, and 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 build a new state, uh, which is will be it will be a miracle in, in itself. Uh, it will be harder than for for it to to collapse um, if if it set on on good foundation. Right, and what's the position then? Where the military are, where, where the Turkish? You said there's a load of Turkish troops there. On the other side of that wall, is there a load of Greek troops or Cypriot troops? How does that actually work? There is a small. Uh, uh, there is a small force by the Greek army. It's around two thousand men, and of course, uh, regarding the Cyprus army, the. Uh, Greek uh, Cypriot National Guard. I mean, there is uh, military service. It's compulsory for all Cypriots. Mm -hmm. We are all reservists. Also, Jake here, we are issued with rifles, appearing uh, two or three times per year to participate in military drills. But uh, there is no action. I mean, you know, in Cyprus, both Zinanas and me, we are going still in the army. We are still practically soldiers. But uh, there is no tensions or interaction uh, between uh, along this line. I mean, there is nothing special that happened the last years. We also have to take into consideration that Cyprus, being a small island, has a huge concentration of armies. So technically you have the Turkish occupying army, the Turkish Cypriot uh, armed forces, the Greek Cypriot uh, army, the Greek army, you have uh, the UNFICIP, the United Nations uh, uh, military force, uh, which is one of the oldest missions uh, of the United Nations, and you have of course the British army. So technically it's uh, like uh, uh, five and a half armies in a small island in the eastern Mediterranean. Jesus, yeah, that, everyone's there for the party. Um, the reason I asked though is because if you look at things like historically in different places where similar situations would hap uh, have happened, specifically with Turkey, um, it's like when, when that does happen, like there are arms, there are weapons, people know how to use them. You know what I mean? It's quite interesting to me anyway. Um, but yeah, hopefully it doesn't come to that. Um, what are the British Army doing there now? I mean, after the, the founding of Cyprus Republic, uh, part uh, some military complexes, some part of Cyprus territory remain under the British rule. It's sovereign uh, soil of the United Kingdom. And strategically, the Brits uh, uh, have been established in uh, Cyprus for uh, strategic reasons since uh, 1878 uh, and there are many reasons uh, for the Brits to be in Cyprus regarding its position uh, in a very hot uh, spot in a very hot uh, area around the Middle East. Uh, there is uh, British troops mostly there is uh, an air base in Akrotiri where a lot of uh, British uh, jets are operating in the Middle East and a small amount of uh, uh, ground troops that are are set it here. Right, got you. It's kind of like a, a launch pad. Um, thinking about that then, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that like if Erdogan fucks around too much in Cyprus, which, you know, he's done it in other places and no one cares. If he does it in Cyprus, due to the fact that there are so many different countries relying on the place, it feels like that's the, the straw that might break the camel's back for the international community. What do you think? Well, I think that's, well, many say that that's one of the reasons, I mean, the involvement of so many countries um, in Cyprus or their operational, let's say, dependency on, on Cyprus. Um, it's one of the reasons why Erdogan would not try something like that. Mm. Um, so it's it's like a deterrent factor uh, that um, uh, probably serves, uh, paradoxically even uh, serves Cyprus well, to or, or despite its its own weakness, military weakness. Um, Cyprus has all these others you know, wanting Cyprus or uh, having interests in Cyprus. So um, the conflict can only be uh, political and, and, and not be militarized. 
Mm. Um, uh, but that, that's, I mean, that's a theory, and uh, hopefully we won't see the opposite uh, being, um, you know, uh, proven. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, give us your uh, your social media handles and, and tell us about your site. Like, where can people see what's going on and get more of your work? Yeah, um, well, you can find us on YouTube. It's always Geopolitical Cyprus, the title also in Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Um, we cover in both Greek and English, uh, mostly Greek, to be honest. Uh, we cover this uh, broader area of, of Eastern Mediterranean and and uh, the Middle East with a heavy focus on um, on Cyprus, Turkey, uh, Greece, and uh, issues of terrorism or uh, conflicts like in Libya and Syria. Um, we do that, you know, on our own time. It's like a side project for both of us, but um, it has a, a quality audience, let's say. Um, good people read it. And it's, it's more of an expert analysis site, but in, in simple language. Um, so thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about that and uh, and for having us on your show. No, mate, thanks for coming on. It's it's one of those areas where a lot of people don't even think about it. But, you know, the more I've been reading about Turkey and the geopolitical situation, you know, I thought, mm, this is actually a place that could get interesting again if Erdogan just keeps messing around with everybody. So thanks very much for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All the best. That was uh, the uh, founders of Geopolitical Cyprus. Sorry, lads, I don't want to butcher your names again. Um, but yeah, check them out. Uh, just Google uh, Geopolitical Cyprus. Uh, it's a really interesting site. It's a place that's definitely overlooked and a place that could be at the center of a lot of problems uh, if Erdogan and his regime carry on messing about across the world. Yeah, definitely check them out, good lads. Uh, if you like what we're doing here at Popular Front, please do consider supporting us on the Patreon. Everything we do here is grassroots, independent, no corporate investment. Uh, go to patreon.com slash popular front for £5 a month. You can get bonus episodes for £10. You get bonus episodes, access to the community discord, narrated articles. You get uh, episodes early before they go on the normal podcast. You get uh, access to this whole series we have called Too Cool for J School, which is just like trying to teach people how to be a journalist. Uh, there's so much there. Oh, yeah, and uh, uh, documentaries. You'll see them first as well on the Patreon. Uh, yeah, definitely check us out. Patreon.com slash Popular Front. Thank you to our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Oracle Coffee Shop in Portland, Oregon, USA. They're an independent coffee shop selling only fair trade products. See them at 3875 Southwest Bond Avenue, 97239. Don't see them now, obviously, because COVID is fucking up everything. Actually, maybe do. I don't know what the fuck it's like in Portland. Maybe it's okay there. I don't know. Like Half America seems open, yet, uh, open and then half it seems closed. And the other half are just like screaming at each other. I don't know. Um, thank you to our other sponsor, uh, Grindcore House. Pair of independent coffee shops in Philadelphia, USA. One in South, one in West. Check them out on social media at Grind Core House. We're going to be doing a uh, special limited edition Popular Front coffee blend with them soon. You'll be able to buy it from them. Uh, this episode is also sponsored by Propagandopolis, an outlet selling and informing people about historical conflict propaganda. Get prints at propagandopolis.com and use the code Popular Front 10. You'll get 10% uh, off. Follow us on social media, Twitter at PopularFrontCO, Instagram at Popular.Front, YouTube, youtube.com slash PopularFront. Uh, if you want to follow me, just uh, at Jake underscore Hanrahan, H-A-N-R-A-H-A-N. My website, jakehanrahan.com, Popular Front website, PopularFront.CO. Um, my mate Sam Hall is going to be fixing that up soon. We're going to have a much nicer website as time goes on, probably in the next three or four months. Probably less than that, actually. But yeah, check us out on uh, all those platforms. Uh, thank you. Uh, oh, no, hang on. Wait, who made the music? Uh, the intro music was by Home. And the outro music, as always, is by Sam Black. 
Check his music out at samblackpf.com. We've got the uh, Artsakh Nagorno Karabakh documentary coming out very, very soon. By the time you hear this, if you hear it when it comes out, it'll be out within the next like week or maybe two, if that. It's all done. It's just getting sound mixed down, colorings being done to it. Wanted to look real nice. Um, shout out to Johnny Pickup, man. Check his work out, johnnypickup.com. J O N N Y pickup.com. Uh, he shot it for us and he's done a fucking brilliant job. It looks amazing. Uh, and that is his real surname, by the way. I did check. I was like, oh, God, is this some kind of guy who's like, you know, oh, I'll call myself Johnny Pickup. No, it's his real surname, Johnny Pickup, uh, and go and check his work out. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you want to support us, if you want this to keep moving forward, the more money we get, the more money we put back into Popular Front projects, uh, go to patreon.com slash popular front. Thank you to the uh, following Patreons for keeping this all moving. They are Cherry Cheng. Ben Marshall, Dallas Dunn, K Glitter Vulcan, Meredith Waters, Bethany Swoveland, uh, C O'Donnell, Adam H, Ryan Barbadillo, Damian Boyd, Larson8669, Bjorn Kirsten, Diamondstein, Jacob, Michael O'Connor, Taylor Kidd, Zach Picard, Todd Cravens, Alexander, Nicholas Butter, Ron Swanson, JD, Jav, Ian Froese, James Cully, uh, Michael Akakan, Ethan, Fitz Madrid, Joe Watt, Ed Coulthard, Johnny LaFleur, Clayton Taylor, Helen Degenerate, Mike Barone, Liam Williams, Chris Cusimano, Degenerate Zero Alpha, Jojo Arani, DR, Trey Nance, Charlie, Amy R, Rubicon, Frank Austin, Amelia Me, Noir Is, Christina Rivetti, Naya Freya Northman, sorry, Ali Hunter, Moody Al Rashid, Bill Wilson, Andrew Hurley, Vida Provost, Brian McLaughlin, Tom Lochrin, Young Wasabi, Surushe Hawazi, Tony Bin, Adam Bergschneider, Sebastian, Stephen Davila, Anthony Kabarak, Dan Dunham, Fletcher Tate, Chad Walker, Diana Gorvenek, Lawrence Abrahams, Peter McCormick from What Bitcoin Did, Emily Molly, Axel Iverson, Christopher Martin, Ryan Sandercock, Sandercock uh, Moritz Zumball, K. Hardy Roberts. Thank you all so much. You know them, them last like 10 or like last five or whatever, these lot have been supporting from literally day one. It's mental. Uh, really, really appreciate all of you. Thank you so much again. If you lot weren't here, there will be no money to do the projects we're doing right now. And honestly, I feel like we're really kind of firing ahead. It's it's amazing to see. I'm not bragging either. Like I'm just fucking so impressed with the way the community is just still flocking towards us, still helping us grow. Um, we've got so many projects coming out this year, even with COVID. I mean, fuck, we got this big documentary coming out um, in the next week or so. Uh, we're doing a big book with uh, Ben Ditto about um, kind of lo-fi technology used in modern war. So yeah, check us out, www.popularfront.co. The website will be made a lot better as well soon. Cheers.
Yeah.